pleased to be back with Brett Bruin of Global Situation Room. Um, Brett, you've got a background with a lot of depth, international studies, foreign service, multiple countries, multilingual. How many languages do you speak? Uh, I guess three at last count. Awesome. Um, can you share with us um, how you've evolved in your career and, and if, if it turned out to be what you want it to be when you grow up type of deal? So I guess the uh, line to my career is whatever the most difficult path was, I opted to pursue that path. So when I first joined the Foreign Service and they handed us a list of 100 uh, countries and said, okay, which one do you want to go to? Uh, I went down the list and said, Ivory Coast, Civil War, sign. Um, and then, you know, even when I signed up for service in Iraq, uh, I wanted to go to the place um, that wasn't in the green zone, that wasn't behind uh, a whole lot of barbed wire and um, tall fences, but um, chose to go to Tikrit because that's quite frankly where the most interesting uh, work is. And even now as an entrepreneur, you know, setting out from uh, a secure job uh, in the government, in the diplomatic service to start over again as an entrepreneur um, certainly wasn't the obvious or the easy choice, but it was one I think um, that was was offering a whole lot of exciting opportunities to build something new. Um, so that's what attracted me. Your mom must love that. <laughs> uh, not sure whether the, the um, parents approve, but I think uh, at the end of the day, what counts is what, what makes you happy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've also been fortunate to work with a lot of different people from around the world. You know, I came from Canada to the U.S., joined a, no, a, a global leadership development organization, nonprofit, all the stuff they tell you not that's not going to advance your career. I took a pay cut, the whole bit. Um, but, I, you know, I've, I've, I've loved the similarities and the differences of working with diff, so many different people and perspectives. Tell us, as they say, your why as it pertains to assisting business leaders to go global. Like, how have you and how do you impact the business with that objective and that philosophy? Um, how do you do it? So the greatest impediment to going global is uh, lack of information. Um, and in that void, um, many business leaders will fill um, uh, a, a whole lot of generalizations or, quite frankly, um, false information that they have picked up uh, from a media story or from uh, someone said that someone said that this country was not going to um, offer much opportunity. And w what really makes the difference is um, when you're able to connect business leaders with really reliable uh, information, credible information um, that's not a bunch of facts and figures, that's not uh, quite frankly, a media story that, that fits into a template um, and into a certain word count, but it really delves into um, the reality of a situation and shows both the, the risks as well as the opportunity. And I think that's um, where we're focusing our efforts because we believe that if you can overcome that information gap, um, then you can get a lot more businesses uh, thinking globally. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, the first time I went to China, somebody introduced me to somebody to go meet in the embassy. And the first thing the person told me there was, I hate to tell you this, but don't trust anybody. Well, and, and it's, um, it's very intimidating. I mean, whether it's, it's China, whether it's uh, Chile, whether it's uh, Cambodia, um, whether you're talking about language, cultural differences, or, you know, as someone um, who's in a senior position in a business association in Ireland told me, look, you know, Irish um, uh, businessmen and women have a great deal of difficulty when they come over to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you could uh, come up with a country that is more similar in more ways to the United States than Ireland. And yet we've got different styles of businesses. We are starting from uh, different points. And you've just got to start, um, quite frankly, in you know the old-fashioned um, telephone, you know, putting some of those uh, lines together so we're on the same wavelength, literally. Yeah, that, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you can tell you're passionate about what you do, obviously, because, you know, you, you did what you did no matter what your mom said. And you're knowledgeable, but it, it is a fast-growing 
I guess, services industry. Now, you got specific great experience to be, I would think, a leader in this. But how do you compete with big players, so-called, that are, that are, or for that matter, on the other side, local regional players that say that we can really help you go global? We know how to help you open up bank accounts to everything else. How do you do that and really ensure that you capture the opportunity for your clients? Well, one of the comparative advantages when you go with the Global Situation Room is you know exactly um, who's going to be doing work on your project. This isn't going to be handed down to a junior associate who's going to compile a bunch of facts and figures, uh, give it to the partner or the managing director, and they'll sign off and hand you uh, a large bill. We're going to assign the work uh, to some former diplomats, to some really experienced um, international operators who know, who know not only the reality of, of one country, but have served um, in multiple countries and have a comparative perspective that is invaluable. I mean, when The Economist sends their uh, correspondence to a country, they don't just want the expert on India or China to go and do more reporting on India or China. They want to bring them to Brazil. They want to bring them uh, to Colombia so that they can offer... Um, almost a, a detached um, analysis of what is happening in this country. How is it in some way similar to what they may have seen elsewhere? Where does it differ? And, and also to be able to, quite frankly, not be the frog in the uh, boiling pot uh, of water who um, sees uh, things uh, the same as, as they've always been and doesn't realize that the temperature is um, being escalated. Well, I certainly know the the risk of not doing it with someone who knows what they're doing is is massive, um, financially, time wise, you know, every which way. And I'm sure I, well, I shouldn't assume that you work with all different size businesses. And the only reason I say that is a lot of smaller businesses are going global faster than they've ever gone, if nothing else, because their competitors are going global, whether they have one product or ten. Um, can a small business um, number one afford it? Um, some, you know, to get the right knowledge and expertise they need, they probably can't not afford it, if you will. But, but how do you work with even small businesses to go global? Well, I think the um, the trends are are heading towards more and more both small businesses, but I would also say startups right. that are both thinking and going global. E-commerce just announced a, a new pilot program, Startup Global, where they aim to in a number of cities across the U.S work with startups um, to from an international um, plan and, um, and start executing on day one globally. I, I think where it becomes more challenging for small and even medium-sized companies is to get uh, a lot of these small companies don't need, quite, quite frankly, can't afford uh, that Uh, one of the large multinational consulting firms would offer. They have perhaps very peculiar questions to their um, their region that they need answered. Or they have, you know, they want to do on a supplier or on a distributor. How do they do that? And and oftentimes uh, the cost for uh, in engaging in that kind of research is, um, or it's just um, too time intensive for a lot of companies who aren't certain of the ROI and therefore uh, always going to be on, um, okay, well, we'll do it at some later point when we've got more. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Um, this is kind of for, like you say, startups and even for, for up and coming leaders. I also know the chief tech officer for the small business at Man, a lot of stuff together too with their startups. Um, And I, as you know, you heard I went to an international nonprofit. Um, also, talk about the experience you got. You know how it impacts, especially in today's world, you going into government and and learning and developing trusted relationships. How that's important to an up and coming leader to get all that. Oh, I think understanding what government can bring to the table is incredibly important. You know, I was at a, a, a conference in Madrid where I sat on a panel. Um, on uh, government's role in entrepreneurship. And the prevailing view was, you know, government, get out of the way. Right. Uh, and yet, having been in the government, tried um, 
with uh, with some success to coordinate um, the U.S. government entrepreneurship. What I know is government actually works best when the private sector, when NGOs come to it with solutions. Government is not a, a innovative actor for the most part. Um, and so the initiative needs to be taken by businesses and by um, the um, civil society community um, to develop proposals. Now, they, they do need to um, do their homework and they um, should go in understanding both the limitations as well as the opportunities um, for what government can bring uh, to the table. But uh, oftentimes, you know, businesses will, will, will leave aside engaging the government um, on a lot of issues just because it seems too complicated. It, it seems um, like it won't um, bear fruit. And, and it's, I think, an, an unfortunate um, uh, circumstance because government in a lot of ways, and we saw it on uh, some of our work on global entrepreneurship, can push frontiers, can take risks, can bring resources, can convene actors together that just isn't possible um, for, from anyone else. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's brilliant, and uh, and I think that's the way it should be. You should initiate, and then use the resources of the government to help you, whether it's execute or or fund in some cases or whatnot. I think that's right up right up the um, the right alley. So, a couple of personal questions here, not too personal, but personal. Um, you probably don't have time for this, but do you have a pet? <laughs> uh, I sure do. I, I bought my wife when I was serving in Venezuela and due to be sent off to Iraq, a, a small fluffy dog, a Pomeranian. So uh, her name's LD and she's uh, she's been with us on a few uh, foreign tours. Awesome. Well, we're doing, uh, I won't tell you the whole story now, but we're doing a, uh, a, a series of photos called Pets and Their Executives. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to include you in that. Do you have a favorite activity or sport? Uh, I love to sail. Um, and, you know, small craft, um, just uh, to be out on the water with the wind on your back, um, healing through uh, uh, the ocean is, uh, is, is my favorite place. Sounds good to me. Um, how about a movie or TV show? You know, I, I'm going to show my government stripes here, and, and I, I am still a fan of the West Wing. Um, <laughs> I, I have to so. say, having, having worked at the White House, uh, it's not exactly like it's shown on television, but it's still a pretty darn good show. It's not exactly like on TV. Who would have thought? Um, how about House of Cards? Not that one, huh? You know, I never had the time in the last few years to get into House of Cards. I, I actually have season one um, and have been meaning to get around to, to watching it. I saw three seasons in a week and a half, basically. It was crazy. Um, do you have a favorite book? Um, you know, I, I actually... I would say um, that my favorite book probably um, goes back to um, the classics. You know, I, I think that um, there are a few books that, that rival um, the Iliad or some of you know the great works of fiction or the great works of, of nonfiction um, that that were were done by some of the classic uh, writers. I'm a I got a master's in world history, so that's sort of uh, um, where my heart is. No, it makes sense there, too. Uh, how about favorite music and food? Um, I, I think I, I would probably uh, have to go with salsa, um, being mar married to uh, uh, Latina. Um, I can't say I'm a good dancer, but uh, I certainly can appreciate the music and the movement. Um, and, and on the food, uh, I, I would probably go with uh, tapas. You know, I think the, oh, yeah. you go to San Sebastian in the Basque Country, uh, and you, you know, go from bar to bar and you've got just, you know, a um, really uh, incredible assortment of different flavors and, and foods. And, and I think that's the best combination that you can ask for. I'm with you there. By the way, a little, uh, a little aguardiente or pisco sour helps the movement. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of pisco sours down here in Patagonia. So uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm enjoying that while uh, I'm down here at the conference. All right. Well, thanks so much. That was great. Terrific.